Frank, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you so much. We were uh, shadow banned or whatever you whatever you call it on Instagram. Yeah. We tried to do it live. It didn't work. But we shall resist. Yeah. So let me introduce you to uh, uh, to my audience on Instagram. You are an activist. You are an author and film producer. You have edited books that I love, like Gaza in Crisis by Noam Kant. with Noam Komsky on Palestine with both Noam Komsky and uh, Ilan Pape. A Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. Uh, you have produced films and documentaries on Palestine. You are one of the founders of the film festival Cine Palestine in Paris and the Palestine with Love Festival in Brussels. Uh, okay. You have done a lot for, for Palestine. So... And for humanity, Frank, we appreciate you. I just want to, I, I know I said that to you many times, but I want to say it again. Thank you. I don't Thanks. want to ask you okay. the question. Of course, it's it's my pleasure. And thank you for being with me. I, I We can't imagine how much I appreciate it. I don't want to ask you the same question that everybody asks you. Why did you become an activist? And why Palestine? And why blah, blah, blah. I want to ask you... Who are you now that you've done this for so many years? Hey, thanks, Adam, for this uh, really amazing introduction. Um, I, I guess it's a, it's a very interesting question because, like, I don't think we ask ourselves this question, right? We all, like, I, I guess on a journey, right? Life is like a journey and every step of the way you become uh, hopefully a better person, you know, that's the goal. And I think um, throughout my maybe now 20 years, 15, 18 years of like activism, you know, that started really with, with, with Palestine, I've, um, I really do think I've become a better person, you know, and, uh, and through the people I've met along this journey, I think every single one of them has brought me, you know, it's like if we were little bricks, you know, and you, you build yourself and you add a little break and you add something. And, and I feel that, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's in the, enabled me to understand things better to know in a way, like, I, I don't want to sound like too, but my role in life kind of thing, you know, like why are we on earth for? And, and I think that I feel like I am who I am only through other people, you know, Mm. and um so yeah this journey and obviously it's, it doesn't stop right uh we've been in touch mm. you and i for for many years we met for the first time in in new york was it a month ago maybe more now mm. and mm. um and the meeting was important for this journey yes. for me anyway you know so yeah for me too for me too i i and i heard this i heard this answer similar answers from people that have been involved in in activism in 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 the human field and in, in the humanitarian field and they all always almost always tell me this i feel like i grew as a person i feel like i have more sympathy and more humanity and the capacity to love even more and to forgive even more it's it's quite amazing it's as if the soul of the universe is on the side of those who actually care who actually care for making this universe a better place yeah so yes and I, I i can totally feel what you're saying and i mean like i think one once when you struggle with people you know when you they become like brothers and sisters to you like very yeah. quickly you know i've only been an activist in a way for like less than 20 years but i feel i've made connections with people that i'd never felt the, for wow. the first 20 years of my life you know like i feel yeah. some people look in brussels like you know after the october 7th and stuff we we met with some groups some people i knew some people i didn't know so i've met new people like maybe like two weeks three weeks ago now and i just feel like i've known them all my life even if i've met them wow. three weeks ago because we we're on the same journey. So it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know. You yeah. introduced me to your friends in New York and we be immediately bonded. 
immediately. Yeah. Now we're like talking every other day. We're we, we go to each other's. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's a friendship that you know yeah. it's going to last because yeah, yeah. It, there's something beyond superficiality beyond like you know let's just grab coffee and watch a movie there i mean that's amazing but there's something beyond that always yeah yeah so uh yes i totally feel uh feel what you're saying i this brings me to something that i i thought we were gonna talk about later in the in the interview but this brings me to to something that you focused on in the book with angela davis which is the idea of intersectionality now people who become involved in the world of activism, really, it's almost like it's their duty to start connecting the dots and see and compare and, 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 and really see the connection between all the, the struggles for, for, for freedom all over the world throughout history. Can you, can you give me your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean and you, you always learn, right? Through this journey, Angela Davis talks about it like so well. The fact that she feels like she's as much of a teacher as a student herself. Yes. And uh, we've organized a talk recently with her via Zoom with the school in, in Brussels. And she was like, Stop asking me questions. You know, I, I, I want to ask you questions. You know, and the fact that you, you learn all the time and, and uh, this. Inter intersectionality that Angela talks about all the time is that once you understand in a way that everything is interconnected, you know, race, class, struggle, you know, it, it gives you a more, a broader vision of the world and, and, and what can we do to actually make it a, a better place. And, and I do think actually that Palestine is at the center of all this because Palestine is like, you know, when you've got a sun, Palestine is the center, but then you've got satellites all over to understand oppression, to understand like EU complicity, to understand arms, to understand struggle and love, to understand, you know. So, um, yeah, interconnections, you know, the, and once you connect all the dots, you realize that it's going to take a while. Right? It's not going to be a, wow. a quick fix, but you know, it's like a puzzle and then you get it and you go, wow, okay, we're here. We have to go to here. We have to enjoy this journey to, but it's going to be fruitful, you know, one way or another, you know, and um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what people like Angela sort of have taught me about, I guess. Freedom is a constant struggle, yeah. constant struggle. I know so, if you can see, like, this is another one. Yeah. Um, the struggle will be endless. It's uh, like wow, John Berger, wow. the the UK writer, who said that. And people people think it's quite sad to say the struggle will, will be endless, but actually it's also the struggle to be a better person. Mm, you know, it, mm. it'll be endless. You'll never be the perfect man yes. or woman, right? Or, yes. But it's, uh, yeah. It's funny that people who are on the, let's say, the opposite side of what we believe in, mm. or like a very different side, they believe that no, it's not. Uh, no, yeah, you don't make mistakes. There's one side that is wrong and one side that is yeah. awful and and bad and evil. That's yeah. basically how they make they they're able to live with their life and not make any effort to to change. They don't step yeah. back and question themselves. Yeah, but I think yeah. uh, I was thinking about this today actually uh, that. It's it's a lot easier to be a nice person than it is to be an <laughs> asshole, right? I don't get it. I'm like, guys, why? Do, it's actually quite easy to be nice, you know. Being an asshole is hard. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Being an asshole is fucking hard. It's so heavy, man. It's yeah. so heavy. It's such a burden. Yeah, it's such a burden. Well, let me go back to to the idea of intersectionality because we see with these movements nowadays, which are, I mean, we witnessed something un, un, unbelievable in the last 20 years in America with the Black Lives Matter and like the Me Too and all that. But my frustration is that you see that a lot of these activists don't are not even familiar with the term. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I don't want to... Uh, judge this harshly but i see from their actions that they don't really consider intersectionality into their uh work 
Do you see that? Do you not see that? Are you frustrated the way I am, especially with what's going on now and their reaction? I guess I, I'm not. I'm not sure because um, also I live in Europe. You know, in Brussels, you in you. I mean, you're actually in Dubai, but you you spend quite a lot of time in the US, and I think it's very different. You know, the way uh, mm. people sort of the activism is quite different. Um, what frustrates me for sure is when it comes to Palestine, because Palestine is part of this puzzle we were talking about before, right? Yes. And the fact that people don't make the link that Palestine is also, you know, a struggle that they need to embrace and they need to be part of any sort of, in a way, political program and stuff. That's very frustrating. You know, the, the term like PEP, right? Progressive except on Palestine. Um, you see this all the time, you know, and uh, and uh, and for me, Palestine is like the, the litmus test, right? Right now, if you call yourself, whatever, someone on the left, a humanist, uh, a progressive, what's your stance on Palestine? If your stance on Palestine is shit, you're not really on the left. You're not really a humanist or, you know, and um, it's a big test. And uh, and we see it now more than ever, like what, with exactly. what that's happening. Exactly. It's, uh, you know, people that don't, like I've, I've heard today, like the EU and others are calling for humanitarian pauses. So they're not even calling for a ceasefire. And when you understand what a humanitarian pause is, it's crazy. It's like, so you can bomb, but like maybe for 48 hours, stop bombing. We'll get the food in and then you bomb again. And then we stop for a day and it's actually mad, you know, and, but it's because, and so I think we're going to talk about this, this whole dehumanization of the, the yeah. Palestinians and even more so yeah. the people of, of Gaza, right? Uh, that yeah. enables people to do shit like that, you know. From the very beginning of this war, this, 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 I almost like had an epiphany that dehumanization of Palestinians reached its peak at this war. Its peak. It it is unprecedented. I mean, it is scary to walk down the streets in Israel right now, being a Palestinian. It really is terrifying. But what's heartbreaking is, again, these people that go and sign these petitions and, like, go live and they associate themselves with, like, the feminist movement or the Me Too or Black Lives Matter. And they don't see that what they're doing is exactly opposite what they're preaching. Exactly mm -hmm. opposite. So what I want to ask you this. How much is it is, how much is it is ignorance? How much is it is paranoia or fear because we all know that there there is this uh, fear from many people to speak out against Israel what it's doing to what it has been doing to Palestinians for years and how much is it is intentional like no I don't I, I actually don't give a shit mm. I, I mean obviously I can't answer you know in on behalf of these people and stuff and I think it's a mix of a lot of the things you've said you know and and I mean in a way ignorance on the issue of palestine is part of it but ignorance has been manufactured by the media and and, and you know yes. and the western media it's uh, it's crazy like people i was chatting to people today on, on instagram telling them in a way what you know bassam youssef was saying piers morgan let's imagine a world with a hamas and actually we've got a very good example Without, because, yeah because yeah, hamas yeah. is not uh, I mean, Hamas exists in the West Bank, but he's not in charge of the West Bank. And still, you know, you've got people being killed, children going to jail, houses being demolished, you know, settlements being built. So it's it's easy to say and to show people that the old narrative right now about Hamas is the core of all evil is, is complete bullshit. And Hamas was created in 1987. I mean, the Nakba was like 40 years before the 67 war was. 20 years before so so you have like 40 years of occupation where yeah. there is no fucking hamas there's no hamas and and it and they still you know so i can't remember which like politician or something said to someone like it's the occupation stupid stupid you know it's like the elephant in the room you know you can't I mean, I was again talking to a, a guy like uh, I, I was. I worked on this letter like with other people for the French media and stuff, and I found some of the French actors and stuff going like, you know, 
I'm sorry, I don't want to take sides. You know, I, I can't take side. And I was like, but there's no side to take if you are on the side of international law, of humanity, and of justice. It's Palestine. That it's very simple. You know, there's no side to take. But but people are very worried, and um, and we see it in the U.S. as well. You know, we we've got friends. You know, common friends that are, you know, struggling with like showing support for Palestine because they're getting, getting threats, getting threats, threats, threats from all over, agents from their, yeah. from all over. But what's and that is the most frustrating thing and the most outrageous about the whole take of international media on what's going on. Like they dedicate ninety nine percent of their interviews with, let's say, representatives of Palestine to discuss Hamas. And they yeah. don't fucking discuss the elephant in the room. Yeah. Can we talk about occupation first? Because mm. you guys came and occupied the land, so, and you still do. Can we talk about the main thing and then discuss whatever the awful things that yeah. happened on October 7th? This is the most frustrating I've ever been my entire life watching, watching, uh, watching TV mm. and watching the news. But let me ask you this. Does it make you feel... Do you question whether people actually, whether people's, are people seeing what we're seeing? What 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 my people and the people in the Arab world and what some Europeans are seeing on TV, live from Gaza? Are people in the West following or in Europe following, seeing what Muhtaz Azaizi is, is posting, for example? And I, mm. I, I want to believe that people are actually not watching, not seeing anything. Mm. That's why they're able to sign a petition, be done with their conscience, yeah. and then go and have burgers and have like, yeah. you know. Mm. Are people watching? Are people not watching? Are people interested at all to watch? Mm. I'm, I'm wondering as well, because like once you've dehumanized the people that much, uh, and you, we've seen it, like the we've, we have like Haaretz, you know, this Israeli newspaper has got so far as like, you know, identified, I think, 683 Israelis who were killed on October 7th. So we know their names, their faces, their occupation, how many brothers and sisters, uh, what they like to eat, uh, how, what music they listen to, you know, the Palestinians that die, like, you know, there's an organization in Gaza called We Are Not Numbers, because Palestinians and Afghanis and Iraqis and Syrians, they, they are always numbers, you know, no one tells you, oh, he liked to play football and he was good at poker or whatever, you know. So I'm wondering if people have been so brainwashed into thinking that these people that we see, I mean, how many people, how many times we've heard Arabs don't consider life as much as we do? Yeah, We've heard this yeah. all the time. And that's why oh, they have yeah. 10 children, because they can lose five. And it's like this horribly racist fucking, you know, yeah. thing, you know, yeah. and... And so I'm wondering if people watch it, they see human beings or they see lesser than human. And then it doesn't matter that much, you know. So, uh, um, but I'm, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm as shocked as you. But I think the years of propaganda and disinformation and has made, um, yeah, people maybe quite insensitive when it comes to Palestine. But maybe, look. Maybe it's only a tiny bit of people because there were like 40,000 people in the streets of Brussels last week, yes. 200,000 or 300,000 in London. Britain, so yeah. a lot of people get it. Don't, let's not forget that a lot of people get it. Uh, but yeah. It's, it's important to remain. I was talking to my friends from the West Bank the other day and they were so down and demoralized. And I was like, it is important to remember that. Remember, I mean, I sound so silly saying that but i was like remember there's light even if it's cloudy there's a sun even if there's a huge black cloud it's always mm. sitting there there is some good happening in the world mm. as we're speaking mm. and yes i was so heartwarmed to see the demonstrations in, in london and to see this guy did you see the tra uh, video of the guy driving the subway and saying in London, no. be free in london and people started saying palestine the driver oh, no, was I, I didn't see it no yeah it's, actually you know like he got, he got fired oh they fired him but but there's still. also stuff like that happening all over you know there's actions that 
you prepare, you work on with like groups and NGOs and committees and and these actions of like random people. This guy in the metro in Brussels as well, like this guy in the metro decided not to stop at Tron station. Tron is where the European Commission is. So oh, one wow. morning, he, you know, all the all the diplomats were like, "Oh, we're gonna get off." He was like, "No, you're not getting off because you." you're messing around like you're not supporting palestine and he didn't stop and this guy you know it's like coming from the heart because people understand that what's happening you know quite a lot of people but then the decision makers and stuff and that's why palestine is also a microcosm on how much is wrong with this world how much the so-called democracy we live in are not really democracies why are we why is trump someone like trump has ever reached has he ever reached power you know it doesn't make sense, you know, but anyway. But before we sum up, because I think we reached the 30 minutes and I'm insisting on making this podcast, this experiment, 30 <laughs> minutes with Adam. I hope it works. But like, I think people nowadays, they're like, they they want something fast and quick. Mm. So if we want to end this on a good note, what would we say? I don't want to say something to to the people of the world. I want to say something to the yeah. people in Gaza and the people in the West Bank. What would we end it with? Look, uh, I think history has, has, has showed us that, you know, oppressive regimes, apartheid ends at one point or another. It does, you know, decolonization in, 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 in Maghreb, in, you know, in Northern Africa happened. Uh, South Africa apartheid, which actually started in 1948, and um, it's um, important to remember it, ended. It's not perfect, of course. In South Africa, it's still this, you know, it's still there's still this rebuild, but it it ended. The you know the discriminatory laws and stuff ended. So oppression ends at one point or another, you know, and. And again, like we are seeing, I mean, what we have to do, I think, and that's the hardest part is the, is to continue, you know, we, we can't only be reactive when Gaza gets bombed, there's like millions in the street for three weeks and then it stops exactly. and then exactly. life go back, so go, goes back to normal. And then we, but it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's tiring, right? Like for the last, yeah. I don't know when it started now, seven to like 20 days for the last 20 days. Exactly. I'm sure you have people haven't slept, people haven't really worked, they left everything, you know, people have canceled their holidays. It, it, it's, it's hard to keep going because we know you and I that once Gaza is not bombed, there's still horrible stuff happening in Gaza and horrible stuff happening in the West Bank and in, in East Jerusalem. And so, but the fact that there are these millions of people in the street, and I think you know, Palestinians told me this when I was in, in Palestine years ago that. You know, for us, seeing like 40,000 people in Brussels gives us so much heart, you know, and yes. so much love. And it's it's a tiny drop, but it's important. When people say like demonstrating is useless, if it's only to make people feel not alone, like in Gaza, it's a good thing, you know, so. It's a great thing. Yeah. And let me add to that, because I'm witnessing the social media revolution yeah. right now and seeing what's happening. I am seeing so many people get educated as we speak. Yeah. Like I'm seeing people speak out. I'm seeing people saying that they have, they are changed forever for, mm. for the better. And, and, and I'm seeing people become like what we said at the beginning of the conversation, becoming yeah. hopefully better human beings people yeah. who care about this place. So, yeah. yes, I would love to end with the belief that this is going to end uh, at some yeah. point. And uh, with us and with the with people like us and with the people that care, it will yeah. end. It will. It will. Frank, thank I you. Really Frank. Thank you so much. I appreciate one. you. Hey, same. Bye, Habibi. Till hey. we meet again. For sure. Bye, Adam. Bye, bye. bye. bye.